I guess maybe we'll do it afterwards. <laughs> but anyways, let's open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 20. Um, before, as we're turning our Bibles there, I just want to encourage you men to sign up for the one-day retreat that we'll be having here. Uh, the cost is $70 right now if you get in, in the, the early bird special. Uh, we have guys like uh, Holland Davis. You guys uh, heard him on, on the last three weeks on, on Wednesday. He gave some awesome messages as he just gave us some Bible prophecy. He'll be one of the speakers, myself, and David Rosales, as, as far as we know now. Um, I do know also that um, um, we're going to have some workshops. Uh, they're going to deal with addictions. It's going to deal with uh, the uh, people at home. Uh, the, uh, being like like men at home, men at work, and stuff like that. So hopefully you guys will sign up. I'm excited about it. We're going to have a great time. Um, again, the cost covers the, the, the breakfast, the lunch, and the dinner, as well as a, a shirt and, and a book that we're going to be giving you guys so you can read. Uh, there will be some games that will be played as well. It's just a great time of fellowship. I do know that other churches have signed up, so uh, space is limited to only 100 people. So I encourage you guys to sign up. You can start making payments now. Um, uh, um, and here's another thing that I also forgot to mention in the first service. Uh, we've been given an opportunity to go to Israel this year um, with, uh, with a couple other churches. Uh, Living Way with uh, um, David Zamora and um, Into the Light Calvary Chapel with Mike Torres. And there's another pastor that's going as well. Um, we're, we're planning to go like in late September, early October. The cost is $3,500. Um, I'm planning on going. I, I told them that I'll see if I can get a group of people to go from this church. So if you want to go, I know it's kind of late, you know, because usually we start a year before, but it's about eight months to seven months away. Um, so I encourage you guys, if you want to go uh, at the Welcome Center, please sign up uh, if you're interested in going. Um, and then as, as more information comes, like the payments and stuff like that, we'll let you guys know. But I'm excited, man. Uh, you know, uh, I heard that it's really open right now. I heard that because a lot of people ain't traveling, that we can visit a lot of sites. So I'm really pumped. So hopefully you guys can go. Uh, we're trying to get 8 to 16 people to go. I, oh, Calvary Chapel First Love Whittier also is planning to join us. So there's going to be a few of us that are going to go. We're trying to get at least, you know, two, two buses. So Lord willing, you can join us. Um, we do have the certificate. So what I'm going to do, um, I'm gonna, if you're here, raise your hand, come up, get your certificate. We'll pray for you guys. And, and, and this is a class that we have, a school of ministry, where we just um, uh, spend some time throughout the months um, helping uh, brothers and sisters grow in their knowledge of Christ. Not only just the Bible study, but they get homework and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool, man. Uh, they've taken the class, and they, they've succeeded. Now we give them a certificate acknowledging that they completed the classes. And, um, and I encourage you guys to take the classes whenever, they come, whenever they're available to you guys. So let me see. Let me go ahead and see if jo Joaquin Luna, are you here? Come on up, brother. <laughs> Just stand right here, and then we'll pray for you. Here you go, my brother. Congratulations, Miguel Angel Lopez. You here? There you go. That's real gold. No, I'm just joking. It's not. Thank you. Congratulations, bro. Cecilia Rodriguez. Nice. Just be careful. Don't fall. Oh, I'm a prophet. Here you go. You can stand right here right quickly. Congratulations. Juliana Jimenez Sesma. Yeah. And also Agrippina Hernandez. Juliana, congratulations. <laughs> Don't fall. Hello. Oh, there That's you go. <laughs> there you go. Come and sit right here. Thank you. And Agrippina, congratulations. Let's pray for them. And then I will give them a, uh, we'll acknowledge them with a hand of applause. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these who have taken the time out of their time to just grow, Lord, in the knowledge of your word. I pray, Father, that you would uh, keep everything that they've learned afresh in their minds. So that they can use it for themselves, but also to use it as they go out into the fields and minister to others, Lord. The fields being the world, and even here, Lord. I ask, Father, for your spirit to just fall afresh upon them right now, Lord. And may they know and be comforted and encouraged by the fact that you are blessed that they took this next step 
in their walks with you. So bless them all, Lord God. Use them tremendously for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, guys. God bless you, man. God bless you. 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 You're welcome. You guys can just drop the check off right there. No, I'm just joking. We're in Acts chapter 20. The title of the message is Encouraged by All Godly Means. And one of the things that I do want to highlight as we're going through these passages is that you are to take everything that you can get your hand on to, to use in, in ministry, in ministering to people. As we're going to see how Paul uses a lot of things, man, to get people to grow or draw closer to the Lord. Anyways, we're in Acts 20. Go ahead and stand. We'll read God's word as we stand to give reverence to his word, actually. But beginning in verse 1, this is what Luke records for us. He says, After the uproar has ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself and embraced them and departed to go to Macedonia. Now, when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed um, three months. And when the Jews plotted against him, he was about to sail to Syria. He decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater of Berea accompanied him in Asia, to Asia. Also, Aristarchus and Secutus, I think I said it right. Let's just call him um, Samuel, no? Or Sammy, or? Of Thessalonians and Gaius of Derby, And Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Torres. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Toros, where we stayed seven days. And Lord, as we see uh, now, we ask that you speak to us. Help us, Lord, to uh, receive from you and to apply it to our lives, God. Take away every distraction, Lord. Help our hearts to be uh, uh, in tune with you right now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. So Paul is traveling what is known as the third or his third missionary journey. We know he's on the route to Jerusalem. He wants to get there before Passover so he can celebrate. But as he's going there, we also know that he has a different, he also has another purpose. And that is to uh, take to the church in Jerusalem uh, an offering that, uh, that he has been collecting in his journey there. We do know that there was a need in the, in the, early, in the church there in Jerusalem. And he felt compelled by God to take this offering to them. Now in verse 1, we read that after the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself and embraced them. And then he departed to go to Macedonia. So Paul leaves Ephesus and heads north to Macedonia, to northern Greece, where Corinth and Athens is, after the uproar. Now, I want you to notice that before he left, he embraced the believers or the Ephesian brothers. Now, notice the word uproar there. What is he referring to? Well, if you remember with me, there was an uproar that we talked about in chapter 19 of Acts. We saw how this uproar was pretty much caused by a man named Demetrius. He was a man who was a, a silversmith. He would make these um, idols of, of the goddess um, what was, it, what was her name? Diana. Diana the goddess. And what happened was that as God was doing a work through the apostle Paul in Ephesus, people were converting. People were abandoning their own ways and started going after God's ways. They forsook their idolatrous ways and they started serving the true living God. But because this was happening, Demetrius' uh, business was going down. Because people were no longer purchasing these idols. So what happens? This guy was upset. He realized that not only his religion was at stake, but also his business, his way of making money. So he gathered some people of the same trait and began to encourage them, began to pump them up to put a stop to the work that Paul was doing. Now, we saw that some of the people listened. They began to, uh, they joined on the bandwagon and they pretty much went after Paul and his disciples. And we see that in verses 28 all the way down to verse 41. Now, I want you to know that, that in the process, there was a man that God used, even though he probably didn't know, uh, who was the city clerk. This individual stood up 
And he began to say, wait a minute, he addressed the crowd and he told this mob that was no doubt upset. Some were confused because they don't know what was going on. They were just going along with the flow. He addresses them and tells them, hey, stop what you're doing. We're not going to, there's not enough evidence to pretty much try these individuals. Now, we saw that afterwards he warned them. He says, don't you understand that we're bringing attention to ourselves? And if we don't stop this, the Romans are going to come and deal with us, man. So pretty much the people took heed. And in verse 41, we saw that they pretty much dispersed. Again, we read, and when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. The people went back to their homes. Now, with that in mind, I want you to note this. As the crowd dispersed, Paul, we know, called his Ephesian brothers and he embraced them before departing uh, um, to, to Macedonia. Now, keep in mind that Paul, along with the brethren there, just experienced a pretty crazy time. A, a frightening time. Uh, uh, keep in mind that the place that they took him in this Colosseum seated about 25,000 people. So a lot of the disciples were brought to that place and there was an uproar that was going on or an outcry that was going on. Now, I am sure if you've ever been in a situation like that, it was scary. I mean, think about it, man. You have all these people against you and you're standing up for the Lord. So what does the Apostle Paul do? Well, he does something that I believe was wise and very important. He encourages the brethren there. Because notice what it says. It says, after the upward had ceased. So it stopped. It came to a halt. Paul called the disciples to himself and he embraced them. And then he departed to go to Macedonia or go north to Macedonia. So again, I want you to know that the word embrace there, if you're taking notes, simply means to draw to oneself or to welcome. Paul welcomed the brethren to himself for the purpose of encouraging them. Another translation reads like this. When the uproar was over, Paul sent for the believers and encouraged them. So he encouraged them. And this was wise of Paul. So after any hard or mild experience of persecution, we can learn from Paul to step up and encourage individuals. Like Paul, we can't do much with discouraged believers. And tell me if that's not true. Paul saw a situation. He saw that the disciples here, the ones who were serving alongside of him, were discouraged. And immediately he acted upon it. He didn't just let it kind of, he kind of swept it down to, you know, under the carpet and just moved on. No, he wanted to minister. Why? Because people who are discouraged cannot really do much in the kingdom of God. They're held back because of that discouragement. And I would tell you this, listen closely. I believe that as a church, or as the scriptures teach, we are to encourage the brothers and sisters who are discouraged. And I'll tell you this, especially in these times, there are many people who are discouraged, especially after the elections, right? So many people had so much hope that, you know, this president was going to win, and when their president didn't win, they were all like, oh, what's going on? In fact, I mentioned before, I even got calls from other brothers who were really discouraged, and I remember one guy calling me and telling me, Pastor, now what do we do? Now I could have said, oh, come on, stop acting like a baby, bro. Nothing. We just move on, man. That's it. But I did it. I realized that it meant a lot to him. So what I do, I encourage him by telling him some truth. I told him, listen, bro. I said, don't ever forget that God is on the throne. God is in control. Shame on us, I told him. Because a lot of us started putting our faith and trust in a man when we should have been putting our trust in God. And not only that, I said, we also have to understand this, man. I said, you know, God told us from the get-go that things were going to get worse before they got any better. So if we're feeling this way, it's because we took our eyes off the Lord. Put your eyes back on God. Remember that, that God has a plan, and that plan is still in action. Just fall, fall in line and just keep doing what God has called you to do. Preach the gospel, especially in these last days. What was I doing? I was encouraging them. Because seeing what everything that's going on, this person was discouraged. And today there's people right now sitting in this church who are discouraged. Maybe they're, they're at work, things ain't working out for them, then they might be, might be let go. Or maybe in their families, things ain't going the way they thought it was supposed to go. And now they're struggling in their marriage and it's discouraging them. Now they're doubting God and they're doubting His word. Or maybe it might just be in church. You're discouraged because a lot of people that signed up to serve under your ministry ain't showing up or they're erasing their names from the sign-up sheets. Either way, discouragement can be used by the enemy to keep someone from going forward in the things of God. And if you're someone that God has placed in their lives, 
Encourage them. Encourage them. In fact, the Bible tells us that we are to do that. Turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse 14, Paul writing to the church of, of, of Thessalonica wrote this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14. In chapter 5, he writes this, verse 14, it says, But now, he says, now we exhort you, we're encouraging you, brethren, speaking to believers, warn those who are unruly, those who, uh, who are, don't want to abide by the rules. He says, warn them. It says, comfort the fainted hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. Now, notice what he's saying. He's saying to warn the people that are living looseless lives, right? Just doing whatever they want. Warn them, you know, uh, that we're doing ministry. You warn them. You tell them, hey, man, be careful, man, what you're doing. Don't you understand that if you continue to live in such a way, God's going to go after you. God's going to discipline you. Because the Bible teaches discipline, that God will discipline those he loves. He's not going to let them get away with sin. So when you see someone, a brother or a sister in the Lord, living life just as they want, Warn them. That's one of the things he tells us. But notice what he says then. He says, he says, comfort the faint hearted. And then he says, notice, uphold the weak. So he's pretty much saying to encourage them, to be there for them, you know, to minister to them. And then it says, with all patience. I love that because God knows we need to exercise patience, right? We need to exercise patience, which is of uh, one of the one of the, the the words that is defined love in Acts chapter I mean not Acts but in First Corinthians chapter thirteen that love suffers long is patient because the reality is we're gonna need patience when we're doing those three things that Paul called us to do patience and also uh, uh, per- perseverance wanting to see them overcome whatever situation they might find themselves. But as Christians, we are called, like Paul, especially when they've come, they've, someone has experienced something pretty hard, to encourage them, to give them uh, some hope uh, by using the Word of God, by, by using scriptures like we just gave. If you're taking notes, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, and Hebrews chapter 10, verses 20 through 25, talks about encouraging one another. Encouraging one. Instead of, you know, belittling someone or questioning, you know, their, their experience or even their walk with God. You know, kind of like Job's friends, remember? When Job was going through some hard times, literally some hard times. You know, he had his so-called friends come to him. And instead of encouraging, what were they doing? They were putting him down. They were questioning his relationship with God. And even he said, man, you guys are some miserable comforters, he tells them. And sometimes we can be like that. You know, instead of, you know, looking, you know, to, to raise someone up, we want to put them down or question their walks. Guys, don't belittle someone. Don't put someone down. Encourage them. When they share something with you, find a way, you know, through the word of God to bring them up. That's what God wants us to do. In fact, Jesus did that in John chapter 21. I mean, we're talking about Peter here who denied the Lord to his face three times. Remember that? And what did Jesus do? He encouraged them. Well, after he was resurrected, and remember they were out there fishing at the Sea of Galilee. You know, Jesus comes up to them. Remember that? You know, and he tells them, hey, you know, pretty much, you know, what are you doing out there? Have you caught anything? And they're like, nah, we haven't caught anything. And then he says, well, get the net and put it on the other side and see what happens. And they did. And when they, when they realized they had fish, Peter immediately recognized it was the Lord. What does he do? He dives in, swims up to where the Lord was there by the shore, and then he walks up to him. God already had prepared a meal in Christ, right? He has some fish there for him, right? And what does he do? He begins to minister to him, and he encourages him. He encourages him to the point where he gets Peter back on track. Because right after that, Acts comes in, the book of Acts. And we see, even as we're reading through the book of Acts, how God worked in Peter's life and worked through Peter's life. Why? Because the Lord encouraged them. See, guys, we need to learn to encourage people. Get them back on track. Get them get, to help them take their eyes off the situation why they might find themselves in and putting their eyes back on the Lord. Remember when, um, when um, Peter was, was uh, uh, walking on water? Remember what happened? He began to sink, right? Because he took his eyes off the Lord and he focused on the, on the waves. And as he was sinking, the Lord was there to pull him back up. And as he's walking with him to the boat, I'm sure he's ministering to him there as well. 
So we need to learn to encourage people. We need to use our words wisely when we're sharing with them as well. In, um, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, Paul said this, didn't he? Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for, uh, what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So we need to make sure that when we're encouraging someone, we're watching what we're saying. We don't want to you know, bring them down. We want to build them up. You know, the whole book of Proverbs, when we went through the book of Proverbs, we read and we learned how Solomon and other guys that were authors of the book st- encouraged us to, to, to use our words wisely. Remember he said, with words you can destroy, you can either bring to death or give life. So use your words. Use your words to try to encourage someone. Or also use, you know, actions, you know, doing something for someone. You know, words and words can be a means that you can encourage a body of believers that is discour- that are discouraged, you know, as a coach. You know, that's one of my main jobs is to keep the girls. I coach girls basketball, you know, uh, my daughter's basketball team. And, and, and one of the things that I have to do, especially last year, was I had to keep encouraging them. You know, because they're, especially when they went down in the score, when the score was being ran up on them, man. And I remember, you know, I, I would sit in the bench and I would look at them and I can see their little faces looking at me like, no, what do we do, coach? And I'm like, listen, you're going to be okay. Stay focused. We can beat this team. We can beat this team. And I would, I, I would try my best to get into their heads so I can get them out of their heads. You know what I'm saying? And I remember there was this one particular game where we were just going back and forth, man. They were scoring and then they would, you know, we would call time out. They'll come back. We'll come back, and we were just going back and forth. My whole job is keep encouraging them. Come on, come on, we can do it, we can do it. And ultimately, we got the win, winning our first playoff game. And we were all excited, but I'll tell you this. If I would allow them to continue to be discouraged, they would have lost the game, and they would have never got another chance to play another game in the playoffs. And that's what we are to do, to encourage people, to help them, you know, to persevere, to be victorious, to turn a trial into triumph. That's what we're called to do. And Paul was doing just that in verse 1. When he saw that they had just come out of this experience where there were the mob was after them, he called them to himself and he embraced them. Again, as another translation reads, he encouraged them. And that's what we ought to do. Verses 2 and 3. Now when he had gone over the region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece um, in the area of Corinth and Athens and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So Paul left to Macedonia and stopped in various towns and he encouraged the believers there as he was making his way to Corinth in northern Greece. He would spend, as we know, time in these churches that he had planted there in these towns. If you remember in Acts chapter 16 and in Acts chapter 17, you see the, that he, these were the churches that the Apostle Paul had planted. So when it says the region that he had gone over, he's pretty much talking about Macedonia and Achaia, which were south of Ephesus. Not south, I'm sorry, west of Ephesus there and, and north. So we saw that he would go there and he would encourage them with many words. And what I see here is pretty cool, man. As I was reading and I was looking, I see that as Paul is making his way to Corinth, and the reason why he's going to Corinth, because if you study 2 Corinthians, you're going to see chapters 1 through 7, you're going to see uh, more details in his journey. And there was problems that were taking place where Paul's uh, apostleship was being questioned and stuff like that, that Paul had w- wanted to go to Corinth so that he can minister to them and help them. But so what he does is he gets Titus, uh, one of his servants, one of his disciples, he gives them a letter and he sends them ahead. Now, when Titus is there, he actually uh, um, you know, gets, the re- gets a report um, he, and he goes back to Paul and he, want, he wants to meet up with Paul and Torres, but they really didn't meet up until they got to Philippi. And that's where Titus gives them the report and it's a, rejo- it's, it's a report that blesses his heart. Because when you read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, or chapter 5 or 6, you're going to see how, how Paul talks about how he was so discouraged. Not so much discouraged, but he was feeling down because of everything that was going on. The persecution that he had to endure. How people that he was trying to minister to were against him. And then he says, but when Titus came with the report, he was blessed by it. So on his road there, what I see there is this. Guys, listen closely. He was stopping at all these areas to minister. So in other words, as he was going to Corinth, he took every opportunity that was given to him to minister to the people that he loved. 
every opportunity. In fact, if you're taking notes, it was in Corinth where Paul actually penned the letter to the Romans. We call it the epistle of the, to the Romans. Now, if you've ever read that letter, that epistle, man, you, you know it was well written, man. I mean, that thing was inspired by the Holy Spirit, no doubt. But we see how, how he, you know, he gives them so much truth. He ministers to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews. And, and we hear, you know, one of my favorite passages, you know, Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves as, as you know, as, as living sacrifices. And man, that's, one my, that's where he penned all that when he was in Corinth, ministry. And again, as I mentioned, as he's traveling and he makes it to Corinth, he's still do, taking the opportunity that is given to him to minister to people. Now, with that, I want to say this. My encouragement to you is take every opportunity God gives to you to minister to the service of God. Wherever it's at, whether it be here, whether it be at work, whether it be at home, whether it be at, you know, at, at another church, you know, wherever you are, take an opportunity to minister. You know, the reason why I believe a lot of us don't take those opportunities is because we're probably afraid of rejection. Or, or, or maybe because we don't know what to give them. <laughs> you know, well, that's why you read your Bibles. That's why you spend time in prayer. That's why, you know, you get, you, you know, you, 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 you have fellowship so that when those opportunities come, you're able to minister to them. Because I'll tell you this, in fellowship, you grow also. Have you noticed that? One of the things that, I, that, 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 I, that I've noticed is that when you're in fellowship and you engage in conversation and information is being passed to and fro, you're picking up that information. You know, I can tell you this. A lot of the things that I learn is fellowshipping, hanging out with guys. You know, I remember when I used to go to Calvary Chapuccino Valley, I joined a basketball, men's basketball team. It was awesome because before we played our game, we would always sit and do devotions. And I got the opportunity to hear a lot of my, my friends back then, you know, just share their heart. And I was learning just in fellowship and right before we played basketball. So, so it's important that when these opportunities come, wherever it's at, that you pay attention. Because in those, you're learning, but at the same time, you can minister to others as well. Don't miss out on opportunities to bless your brothers and sisters with the word of God, but also to bless God as you serve him. So, again, we see how Paul has gone to Corinth. He's going there uh, um, to address an issue that was brought up. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 all the way to chapter 7. You can read about, you know, that whole situation there. Um, Luke tells us again that, 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 that Paul stood in Greece, most in Corinth, for about three months. And during that whole time, there's no doubt in my mind that the Apostle Paul was ministering. Now, if he's not preaching, he's praying. If he's not praying, he's writing. Every moment that he had, it was all about serving, all about preparing himself for opportunities. And even here, even as he's at Corinth, he's thinking about the brethren in Rome. Think about that. And he's writing to them. Man, can you imagine if we were like that? Can you imagine if our whole being was committed to the service of God? Man, when you get to heaven, man, it's going to take a long time before God gives you all your rewards. But can you imagine if this church was like that? If we were set in preaching and praying and studying and giving? Oh, man. God can do a great work just like he did through the Apostle Paul. You know, this is a calling that God has placed on you and in me. To be constantly active, looking for those, for those windows that are open for us to do a work for the Lord. And that's what Paul was doing as he's making his way from, from Ephesus to Torah to Philippi to Berea all the way down to Corinth. He's taking those opportunities to minister. He's going to his ultimate place there in Corinth. But as he's making that roundabout, he's still doing a work for the Lord. You see, he understood that we are to be available 24-7 to do the work of God. The question is this, are you available 24-7? Or do you punch in and punch out in your walk? Like you punch in on Sunday, but Monday you punch out. Think about it. We're to be available for the work of God 24-7. Now I want you to notice another thing. I want you to know that um, he gets word. Again in verse 2, uh, we're told that, um, um, in verse 3, I'm, I'm sorry, he stayed there for three months there in Corinth, possibly Corinth. And when he saw, and when, and when the Jews plotted against him, as he was about to sell to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. 
So as he's serving the Lord, as he's planning, you know, to make it to Jerusalem to before Passover so he can celebrate it, he gets word that they want to kill him. You know, this was just a, a, a short uh, uh, journey there on ship. But, but what happened was is that he hears that they were plotting. So here you have these enemies of Paul who hated him and wanted to stop the work, planning to get rid of him. They wanted to murder him. Can you imagine their plans? <laughs> you know, the Bible says that the heart is wicked above all things, right? Deceitfully, deceitfully wicked. So you can imagine what they were planning. I wonder if they were planning, you know what? We'll grab them, we'll tie them up, and we'll throw them overboard. Maybe tie something on his leg so he can drown. Either way, they were planning, and God makes it known to him. So what does he do? He makes different plans. He, did, he, he figures out a different way. So now, instead of uh, going across the Mediterranean Sea there, he goes by, um, um, through the land uh, the opposite way um, so he can um, you know, make it to Jerusalem before Passover. Now, in verses 4 and 6, here we, um, we have a, a list of, of Paul's traveling companions that came from various places in which he had ministered. Now, these men were most likely the official representatives of the churches chosen to accompany Paul as he took the offering to Jerusalem. Uh, if you're taking those, cross-reference 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 3 and 4. So many believe that most of these people that were traveling with Paul were guys who were representatives of their churches in the areas that, that Paul ministered to. Now, the question is this, why would they accompany him? Well, very simple. They were taking their offerings. And this is what I, 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 as I was reading that, I said, I said to myself, you know, is it possible that they went with him for number one, for safety, and number two, for accountability? For safety and accountability. Why would I say that? Well, because it's important that when you do ministry, you don't do ministry alone. But that, and even in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 1, when Jesus sent his disciples out, do you remember how many he sent them at a time? Two. For what? For ministry. So they can help each other. So they can back each other up to hold each other accountable. Especially when they're carrying the money that they collected from the churches to go to Jerusalem. Think about it. So in ministry, it's important that we hold ourselves accountable with other people. Other believers. You hear me? Because I'll tell you this. If you're, not holding, if you're doing things on your own, you're, you can put yourself in a position where you can be hit and then you can fall. And disqualify yourselves. As a minister, I remember Billy Graham saying three things that can destroy a minister is pride, women, and money. These are the three things that ministers or people that are called need to be aware of. Because the enemy will use those three things to bring you down. Especially when you're dealing with money. Because have you noticed, man, that's one of the, one of the things that, that many, a lot of ministers have fallen. They take from what is not theirs. So it's good to have someone who's going to hold you accountable. I know that when I would travel to go minister uh, in different areas, you know, here or on the other side of the world, man, I've always traveled with someone. Always. I've always taken, you know, my daughter, her, her thing was Texas. My other kids, they wanted, you know, Jonathan and Isaac, they would go with me when I go to New York or Boston or wherever. I would take them with me, number one, because, you know, I like to have my kids with me, but number two, for accountability. For accountability. And when they couldn't go, I would take someone else, someone from this church. I'll say, hey, can you guys go with me, man? Uh, I'm going to go minister here, and I would like if you go with me, you know, for accountability purposes. You know, one of the things that I used to like about Billy Graham, he traveled a lot, is that he would even say, you know, he, he was very careful, you know, when he traveled because he, was, he had a big target in his back. The enemy wanted him down. So what he, what he would do before he would go to a hotel, he would call the hotel before he arrived there, and he would ask the TV to be removed, lest someone tries to accuse him of watching things he should have been watching in his, in his hotel. Which is wise. Integrity. It takes, you need integrity to be in ministry. So what I would do, <laughs> I would take someone with me and, so I can hold myself accountable. I remember one day when we went to Visalia, I took one of the, uh, two of the guys from here, or three of the guys here, and we went over there to do ministry. And I remember when we were going into our hotel, we actually took a, a little walk around the little town there. And we had a great time. We went to go eat. And then while we're heading back, you know, we, we passed through the jacuzzi that was outside there. And there was all these girls, man, in bikinis. And I remember, man, just telling the guys, keep your eyes looking forward and let's keep moving forward. Don't. And the girls were like, hey, what's up, man? And we even told them, listen, we're ministers and we're doing a work for God. And, you know, we're just going to keep on walking, you know. What was I doing? I was keeping them accountable. They were keeping me accountable. Why? Because the devil uses his opportunities to bring you down. 
So traveling with someone to hold you accountable or to just keep you safe, it's, it's important. You know, so I would encourage you, listen. You know, don't think, oh, that I'm me. I, I'm, you know, I'm like this holy person. I'll never fall. Oh, man, be careful. Be careful because we, we've been warned in Scripture to take heed as we fall, right? And great is, is, is the fall. So it's important that we note here that as they were traveling with Paul, I wonder if they were there to, to keep him accountable, number one, to keep him safe, and number three, to be encouraged, to be encouraged. You know how many times I've turned to uh, someone that went me and says, hey, pray for me, man, because I, uh, I need this, man, I'm nervous, or well, I need this, and I ain't doing well, you got this, man, you'll be all right. So travel with someone, hold yourself accountable. Luke tells us that these men went on ahead, and then they waited for them at Troas. But instead, they, um, they, Luke includes himself, they sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. Five days later, they met up with them at Troas, where they uh, stayed there for seven days. And no doubt, they ministered. Now notice here, you, you, use the, you find these words as us and we, which shows us that Luke meet up, met up with them. He, he joined the group, in other words. In fact, the last we that we read about was in chapter 16 when Luke was with them. But now he's back with them and he's traveling with them as well. So Paul, along with Luke and probably Titus, they probably met up in Philippi there. They crossed the, uh, the Aegean Sea uh, from Philippi to Torres and they stayed there seven days. Seven days. Now I want you to notice what happens in chapter verse 7. Now this is, now this is, is, an, is a pretty cool uh, um, story here. Because I find this happening a lot in churches. And, and you know something, guys? I'm okay with it. And I'll show you why. It says, now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, now notice what happens. Paul, ready to depart the next day, it says, he spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. I want you to think about this for a moment. Paul is teaching on the first day of the week. Now, the Jews used to meet on the Sabbath. Right? So the first day of the week, which was Sunday, was a normal work day for them. Okay? So people after work came where Paul was, and they sat, and they heard him speak until midnight. Think about that. That, that was a few hours there. Maybe four, maybe, I don't know, four or five hours. Hearing him speak. Hearing him, you know, being taught the things of God. Being encouraged. Being ministered to. Fellowship. Breaking bread and so forth. They were just having a great time in the Lord. And then something happens. Now, before I say anything, though, what happened to those days? When people will come together and just get lost in the, in the Word of God. Or get lost in fellowship, ministering to one another. I think television <laughs> has replaced fellowship in a lot of homes. And even in, in, you know, in my life. Wouldn't it be cool if we can go back to those days? Or we can do it now. Just fellowship. Get to talk. Now, dude, if we go over a minute, we're already condemning the pastor. You know? Questioning my salvation. Is he really saying he went over five minutes? No. <laughs> they were till midnight just fellowshipping, just reading, just hearing the word of God. May God give us a hunger for his word. A hunger to know more about him. A desire to be among brothers and sisters where we can encourage one another. And grow and, and change inform, exchange information so that we can do a better work for God. And there he is till midnight sharing. And I can picture the people just in tune, listening, just like you guys are listening right now. Just being edified, being built up in the things of God. So there they are. As he's ministering to them, he taught until midnight. <laughs> They were tuned in as you're feeding on God's truth. And that's my prayer and desire. That God will birth within us a greater hunger for his word. To get lost in his word. You know, the other day I, I, um, I woke up early, man. And, and, and I went to my, to my living room. And in my living room, there's this big old teddy bear that somebody gave to my daughter. But anyways... And, 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 and after I kicked it a few times, I kind of put it on the ground and, and I, I kind of leaned over it and I got my little coffee cup right there and my Bible. And I just started reading. 
I read some books on prayers, and then I started reading the Bible. I started reading First King. That's my devotional time. And started reading, you know, uh, what I'm going to teach, and started reading what I'm going to teach on Wednesday as well. And and when I least expected, man, it was almost two o'clock. And I told Sonia, "Oh my goodness," I said, "I just got lost in the Word," and you just woke up. No, no, I'm just playing. <laughs> but I'll tell you this: I was so blessed and and lost time, but I, I gained a lot of knowledge. I gained a, a great. I spent a great moment with the Lord just building my relationship with him dude I encourage you guys to do that man turn off your 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 phones for a moment you know put it aside you know some of you guys will use it for commentaries or for you know a word studies that's cool but but what I'm saying is get away from the world and just relax with God you know d- don't look at your watches just keep your eyes on the word And I promise you, as you do that, you're going to grow. You're going to be encouraged. You're going to be blessed. I guarantee you. These guys were, these individuals were blessed as they were seeing, as they were hearing what God was doing in the life of Paul, but also what he was saying, what God was saying through the lips of the apostle Paul. So check this out. I like this. Notice. So there it is. Midnight. And notice it says that there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And I believe that's an important thing because here's the thing. Notice that it goes on, it says, and in the window at, at, at a certain, there was a, hold on. And in a window sat a certain young man. In the original language, it gives, it, there's two, there's two um, views here. Some believe that he was from the ages of 7 to 14. Others believe around 18 to 21. Either way, they were sitting at the window. The lights are, lamps are on, so the oil produces a fume, right? You know, that probably got him sleepy. Uh, the people were gathered, probably the, it was hot inside. You know, you know how when something gets hot in here and you're listening and you're like, dozing off? You know, so just picture like that, right? So here's the fumes. It's, it, it was a work day. If he was 18 or 21 years old around there, it was a work day. So he probably got out of work, went to a Bible study. So he's sitting there, probably sat at the window pane there just so he can get some fresh air. I don't know. The point is he was falling asleep. Not that Paul was boring. Because, man, you read his letter, he wasn't boring. Because there could be some pastors that are boring. He's talking like this the whole time. And you're like, oh, he just hit off. <laughs> so he was, uh, so I know he wasn't bored, but probably tired. Probably um, hot. The, 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 the fumes from the oil probably was getting him sleepy. And notice what happens. It says this. And at the window sat a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into deep sleep. Like that. He was overcome by Stephen. In original language, he was battling, it says. He was battling, but guess who won? Sleep won. Notice this. And as Paul continued, Paul just keeps on going, man. Just like I do when I see you guys falling asleep. He just keeps on, you know, speaking. And he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Could you imagine that? They're all right there. It's at midnight. Paul is speaking. And I'm sure, you know, he looks at the back and he sees him doing this. But he's fighting it. And I don't know where I wonder if Paul looked to the right. And then when he looked back, boom, he's gone. <laughs> but I'm sure he probably heard, ah. And boom, he dies. So what does Paul do? Well, check this out. Paul went down, fell on him, and embraced him. And he said, do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now, we know that he died. And Paul, with the power of the Spirit, brought him back to life. Check that out. Now, as we read this, we might tell ourselves, oh my goodness, I can't believe this guy fell asleep. What kind of spiritual man is that? That he falls asleep while the word of God is being taught. You know, I know there were some in there that probably said that. Because I know that happens here. I see you guys' face when someone starts snoring out loud back there. In fact, there's been times where we have a snore here, right? <laughs> right here. And, and you know what? It happens on Wednesday, especially on Wednesdays, because some of them, they go out of work and then they come right out of work. They skip dinner and they come right to church. And I can see them, man. Especially when I make eye contact with them. <laughs> to the point where they'll come up and they'll come up to me and say, Pastor, oh man, I, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. And I look at them and I say, don't worry about it. I said, here, let me tell you this. I tip my hat off to you. Why? Because you're here. You're here. And God can still speak, can still speak to you even while you're dozing off. And it's true because in 1 Samuel chapter 3, I think it is. In 1 Samuel, we have a story in chapter 3. 
Remember, he was in the temple when Samuel was a young, young dude. And what happened when he was in the temple, the Bible says that he was laying down. So he was trying to get some sleep. And God speaks to him. He goes up and he says, he goes up to Eli and says, hey, were you, were you calling me? He, to the priest. And he says, no, man, it wasn't me. So he goes back and he tries to doze off again. And while he's dozing off, God calls him again. And he says, was it you? He goes up and goes, was it you? Were you calling me? And he's like, the priest says, no, it wasn't me, man. You know what? Next time that they call you, say, here I am, Lord, see what happens. So he goes back, he lays down, the Bible says, and he's falling asleep again. And the Lord speaks to him. And then he tells him what he ought to do. So what does that teach us? Very simple. That you can be dozing off and God can still speak to you. So when I see people falling asleep because they came out of work tired, I don't condemn them. I tell them, you know what? I am blessed that you're at least here. What about the other people that don't even come to church? But you're here and God's going to bless you. And you know something? And I told someone like this, just the fact that you're here has blessed my heart. I'm encouraged by your commitment, man. But don't, let it, but don't let another snore happen. No, I don't tell them that. <laughs> so before we condemn them, let's give them props, no? Let's give them props for at least being here. Now notice what happens as I close. It says, Paul went down, verse 11. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten, check this out, and talked a long while. That means Paul was a talker. Kind of like I am, you know? And he says, even till daybreak, then he departed. Daybreak is 5 o'clock in the morning. So he spoke as soon as they got out of work to midnight. They had the little incident, right? They got to see the power of God as he was brought back to life. That's big. They got to hear Paul speak even more. And I'm sure that he kind of used that to encourage them even more. So they not only did they get, uh, you know, some things of Paul, but after that miracle, now they're receiving greater depth, you know, de- greater truths, and now they're even more inspired. But it took them spending time with God those hours. Don't be so quick to rush out of services where you miss out on what God has for you. Are you guys hearing me? You know, they left at 5 in the morning. We should do that right now. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but think about it. Some of us are so quick to rush out to go home. For what? Just to turn on the TV and watch the news? We're so depressing. To catch that last part of the game? And you miss out. You miss out on what God did in someone else's life. Maybe someone was discouraged, but they got encouraged by the message. And they want to share it with someone. And who knows if God was going to use their encouragement to encourage you. But you left. You missed out. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? Stick around. Listen to the people of God as they share. Because in the process, you're going to get ministered to. You're going to get more out of it if you just stick around. That's what we see happening here. Notice. And they brought the young man in alive. So I'm sure they're all like tripping out on him. Hey, let me. You still... Were you bruised at least? I mean, let me, see your, let me see your hands. I don't know what's going on, right? And they were not a little comforted. So they were not a little comforted, but comforted a lot greatly. They were encouraged. They were encouraged. Listen, I encourage you guys. I encourage you guys like Paul to find every opportunity, any means you can get your hands on, To encourage people. That's what I see here in Paul. Even the death of this young, this youngster. He used that story there, right before their eyes, to even encourage them and comfort them. Man, if we will only be available to be used by God in such a way. May God help us, no? Not to live selfish lives. But to live lives that other can benefit from it. Through your faithfulness. Amen. We'll stop here. We'll pick up next week. And Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask God that even as we see these, this story, Lord, by this youngster, Eutychus, Lord. Who was there listening to one of the greatest preachers that ever preached the gospel in Paul. 
And God, what a, what a, a reminder and an encouragement and a blessing to see, Lord, that you don't condemn those that fall asleep. But you're blessed that they're fighting and trying to listen to what you have to say to them. May we, Lord, fight too. And it's sad, Lord God, when we see people don't fight, don't, not fighting. So they stay home and they miss out. They miss out. Watching online, Lord, is not the same, I know, as being here in fellowship. Watching from home robs them from listening to others here who have been encouraged, who have gained knowledge, who have gained a blessing. Help us, Lord. Help us to stop making excuses. And just engage with your people. To put ourselves in a place where you can speak to us through your word. I think of Mary and Martha. Where Martha was so busy that she missed out. Missed out on you. But Mary sat at your feet and heard from you. Help us to sit at your feet. To hear from you Lord. And then to pass on to others. What you've taught us. And listen, with every head bowed and every eyes closed, maybe you have not taken up those opportunities that God has shown you to be minister or to minister to. Maybe you're miserable because all you're doing is living for self. And because you're living for self, you find yourself sinning against God. You see, one of the things that I see, listen closely, guys, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. One of the things that I've learned, even as I'm looking at the life of Paul, is that the reason why you don't read of him sinning, <laughs> because he was so occupied in doing a work for the Lord. Maybe the reason why you're still in sin, the reason why you find yourself compromising is because you have so much time in your hands. You need to get back on track. Get back to serving the Lord. Because the more you serve Him, the less time you have for yourself. Because God knows when we have too much time for ourselves, what we do with it, huh? Maybe it's time for you to get back on track today. And if that's you, listen, all I'm asking of you is to be honest with God. And say, Lord, forgive me for getting sidetracked. Forgive me for not being there for my brothers and sisters. Forgive me for living for self. Now help me to live for you and for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe you're here for the first time. And all this is just stories. Well, guess what? You've been brought here by divine appointment. God orchestrated this morning for you to come and to hear these words from me. God loves you. And he proved that love by sending his son Jesus Christ. To die a brutal death. To pay for the penalty of your sin. Jesus himself said that if you believe in him. In the work that he did. You will have everlasting life. And you will not perish. Perish in hell. For not receiving him as Lord and Savior. Listen, he loves you so much that he woke you up to come here so you can hear the gospel. But you have to respond in faith and receive the forgiveness of sins. Receive him as Lord and Savior. The Bible says that if we believe in him, if we can believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that he is Savior, that he is Lord, that he died on the cross, was buried and raised on the third day. He said, you will be saved. There's a guarantee of salvation. If you believe, the word carries the idea of trusting, placing confidence upon. He says, you'll be saved. 
And I want to give you that opportunity to respond today. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, listen, after the service to my left, your right, there'll be some people here in the front. If you said this, if you say this prayer, please see them afterwards. Okay? They'll give you a Bible if you don't have one, and they're going, they want to pray with you and encourage you. But don't leave without seeing them, please. If this is you, listen closely. I'm going to say this prayer. Know that the prayer doesn't save you, Jesus does. But through prayer, you're confessing your need of him. And you're also confessing his lordship, which is important for salvation. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you want to be saved and your sins forgiven, repeat after me. Church, you can pray to say, dear Lord, I know that I am a sinner and that you came to die for sinners. You came to die for me. Forgive me of my sins. Come into me, Lord, and cleanse me. And give me a new start. So that I can follow you all the days of my life. By faith I receive you Lord. And I thank you. For forgiving me of all my sins. I open up my heart to you. And I ask you to come in. Work in me now. And through me for your kingdom. In Jesus name. Amen. And Father I pray for those who prayed. And I ask God that you would do a work in them as well as everyone else in this room. Bring us back on Wednesday to continue to get encouraged, to get, in, to get fed your truths. So that Lord, as we see the day approaching, <laughs> Lord, we know this generation is going to see your coming. Oh God, prepare us so that when you come, you catch us doing a work for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. God bless you guys.